Hello, we're here with uh, Chris Brakedahl, who is uh, the current uh, Office of um, Su Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, um, and he is also running for re-election. Would you like to go ahead with your two minutes? Great. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for accommodating this. This is a pretty remarkable time, and I'm really grateful that you are uh, still very, very engaged in trying to uh, interview candidates and give us an opportunity to earn your support. So I thank you. I am Chris Rakedell, State Superintendent, uh, running for re-election. It's been a pretty remarkable four years. Uh, you've got some folks in the 36th who are really kind of the tip of the spear in terms of leading the way on fully funding uh, or trying to fully fund basic education. We've made a lot of progress. We're not there yet. Uh, but we're up about $4 billion per fiscal year, about $3,500, $3,800 per student. Um, record levels so far of investment in students with disabilities, uh, the highest capital budgets we've had. We de-linked standardized tests from graduation. We brought back NCTE pathways. We've um, had seen the fastest graduation uh, gains in students that we really are focused on. Um, but there's still big gaps, and so there's still so much work to do. I just, I want to honor literally some folks in the 36 who have been leaders, Summer, uh, Robert, and others who have been huge on this work. Um, I'm grateful for the progress we've made. I tell everybody the superintendent actually doesn't do anything by themselves, nothing. Uh, it's always in partnership with the legislature, the governor, community partners, um, and educators are really the heart and soul of what we do to actually get all those results. And so I'm grateful to sort of steer the ship, to be a champion. Uh, you've seen me take a lot of risk in protecting our DACA students to protect our LGBTQ youth. I push forward, uh, you know, legislation, agency requests on sexual health education. We've tried to lead with values that, that focus on equity. And so I'm really grateful for the work. There's so much work to be done. And post COVID, of course, we've got to defend our gains. We've got to make progress further. And um, there's just an enormous amount ahead of us. And I think my skill set fits it pretty well. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll move into our pre-prepared questions. Uh, again, these are two minute responses and some of them are a little long, I believe, but question one has already been posted. Uh, the next person is Laura. Would you like to ask question one? Public education has always been a gateway to opportunity and mobility for all, regardless of economic circumstances, a cornerstone of the American dream for all residents. However, powerful corporate interests have been steadily undermining public school teachers and unions and siphoning money from our public K through 12 system. Please share your personal values and principles regarding public education. Do you support charter schools, school vouchers, and standardized testing? Yeah, thank you. There's a lot in that question. I'll be as judicious as I can here. The, the question itself describes my life. Um, so I grew up on public assistance, welfare, rent assistance, and more six siblings who spent two years in the foster care system. We were the product of alcoholics and neglect. And so um, it was my way out. It's what I did to create an opportunity uh, for better success. And I love my parents. They're both deceased by now. They did get recovered. They did reunite the family. But it was always about public ed for me. It was always my chance and I want to be a teacher and I had a great honor of doing that. Uh, ultimately a school board member, higher ed. I've, I've served in all these roles that were always about public ed because I really do believe that it can be the great equalizer. It isn't the great equalizer right now um, yet. It doesn't, it doesn't have that promise at the end of it, but it has that opportunity, which is great and it's a powerful step for us. Um, it has to be retained in its form with respect to the public in control and locally elected school boards and that delicate balance between state and local. So as you know, in my work on the legislature and here now, I've had to work really, really hard to keep fending off uh, particularly Secretary DeVos and the federal regime, both Democratic and Republican, I will remind you, uh, who have pushed very aggressively for voucher programs. They are segregatory. They desegregate schools. Uh, there's no research that says they're better. Or, or that they are helpful, they are in fact quite damaging, and they destroyed the public trust because it makes people feel like uh, there's no public, there's no common, every dollar in taxes is somehow in their minds a dollar owed to them, and that's a really destructive thing. So uh, charters, I didn't support the law, in fact I worked on legislation to uh, unwind it all. It is the law though right now, and I have a responsibility to send apportionment to the charter uh, districts uh, consistent with our public school districts. And then um, the last question, I don't remember the last component of it, but it was charters, vouchers, and oh, testing. 
uh, so obviously I'm not a fan of standardized testing. We've delinked it in our state. The feds still require it. Uh, but this year I was the first state in the country to declare that we're done with it for the, for the year. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, would you like to go ahead with question two? Coronavirus has had a major impact on public education and on student learning. What is your plan for addressing students' academic, social, and emotional needs that stem from the springs and possibly into the 2020-2021 the school year necessary disruptions? Yeah, a couple of things. We were a state that uh, built a continuous learning plan expectation for our districts. And so we saw states all over the country just grab really, really different models, of course. And the right to work states in the South were just slashing education expectations because it was their way of saying, well, now we don't have to pay educators. So we made a different decision in the state. We pursued continuous learning. All of our districts have prepared continuous learning plans. Um, we know that we wanted to build some momentum. It is not ideal, and believe me, if we, were, if we were designing it today, you would not design an online system. It is really not an effective model. It supplements face-to-face -face learning, uh, but we have to make sure we get back to that really high-touch, comprehensive, whole-child approach. Uh, the key here is that we have to at least keep our financial gains and start to grow them again, so we can't slip backwards. We can't let people use this moment as an excuse in the budget to walk away from public ed or the, all the progress that we've made. We do need more connectivity and access for students, but again, it's, it's because we had always built a system dependent on it, not because it's a system that should shift to online learning wholesale. So we've got to make those investments happen. We've documented where we think the biggest gaps are. We're building out Wi-Fi right now. We're trying to purchase connectivity for all of our frame reduced price lunch families. And again, it's about creating an equitable opportunity, uh, but it is never about transitioning to online. It's simply not the model that is best for kids, certainly uh, not in K-6. Having them sit in front of screen time even more is not a healthy thing. So hang on to our gains, hang on to our gains, continue to build momentum, defend public ed vigorously, have high expectations for educators and students, build out capacity for connectivity, but get us back in our face-to-face -face model uh, with our equitable uh, plan, and that's gonna be a, a healthier thing for kids. Thank you. Uh, Lori, would you like to take question three? Sure, Chris, thanks for being with us tonight. So do you support full and ample state funding for ELL students, special ed students, transportation costs, class size reduction that Washington voted for in 1351, and the increased counselors, social workers, teachers, nurses, and administrators that were also approved in 1351? If so, how would you advocate for the necessary increase in state budget? Yeah, I really do support those. And so um, I was a champion of that in the legislature. And obviously our work at OSPI has been to build out those component parts. The legislature in McCleary, of course, rewrote, if you will, basic ed finance, picked up some of those pieces, but did not wholesale grab it at all. So one of the cool parts is we've been tasked and we have completed a very comprehensive look at 1351. We've made it the foundation of our budget planning for the next couple of biennium. We've said to the legislature, you didn't fully and amply fund all the way. And as you reimagine basic education to do what it should do, so not just filling up the old formulas, but kind of transforming, given what we know about kids in terms of mental health and supports, um, EL support, students with disabilities, they've made progress. It's good, but it's not ample and it's not full yet. And so we use 1351 as our baseline. We've rewritten the prototypical school model that's sitting there waiting. It, was, it is going to be the, the basis of my biennial budget request, uh, but it's gonna be a stunning uh, complex moment with revenues down. Um, what we have to avoid is what's happened in the last two large recessions where people use it as an excuse not to act on revenue. They use it as an excuse not to act on investments. Um, the, the, the progressive champions of our century uh, took these moments to double down on the public sector and invest more. So we have a 1351 plan. It is the basis for our rewrite of the prototypical school model. Uh, I intend to advance that as 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 I can with high expectations. Uh, we just collectively have to make sure that the legislature does not use this um, as a moment to say, you know, let's go backwards or even let's pause. Uh, we will recover and we have to keep transforming a larger and larger share of GDP into public education. So that's what the plan will do. Great, thank you. Um, and then we have question four, Summer.
sorry, I'm going to the chat on a phone. So, okay, what are your priorities for addressing racial equity in Washington's public education system? Well, it's really about that transformative investment strategy, of course, and the old formulas are a baseline, but all the new money really has to be focused on closing gaps. Um, we know them better than we ever have. Uh, we came in and created a really flipped around our data systems, turned them open to the public, allow everybody now to see how their school is performing right down to um, different student groups, uh, multiple measures that we look at. So we, we have removed the excuse that we don't know um, with our data approach. And what we have to do is get this 1351 plan fully deployed and then not just use old formulas. The, the new incremental money by and large has to follow student need and it has to follow communities where there's high poverty and there's high, um, high demand for support services. And you know, that's gonna be hard for legislature in the short term, but it's the only thing that'll change the game. Uh, fortunately, we've built our strategic plan in our office around equity. We've wiped out the old uh, model. We've diversified the team and is the most diverse cabinet, the most diverse executive team, and the most diverse agency OSPI has ever had. So we're putting the building blocks in place too so that some of the decision makers are significantly more likely to reflect our students. Um, and, and we have to do that across the board. Our teachers, our school board members, our administrators, you have to have the right people in place to see racial injustice. And then you have to have a funding system where the money follows the need. Great, thank you. And so that concludes the uh, four prepared questions and we'll be moving into uh, follow-up questions, which are one minute in length uh, for responses. Um, does anybody have any follow-up questions that you'd like to have, ask? If so, please uh, raise your hand um, using the button or you can type it into the um, chat box. And sometimes it takes a little while. Um, Robert, go ahead. Awesome. Uh, thank you for joining us again. And I appreciate your answers, especially on the online learning um, and on what has happened so far with McQuery funding. Um, I'm just curious. Um, <clears throat> I, I really appreciate, in fact, what you said about how we were able to make those strides over the last few years in terms of funding uh, and your commitment to protecting that from the legislative action. What would you be willing to do in your role as OSPI to try to push back against any further cuts? especially given that there's a big revenue shortfall looming uh, so that we're not winding up, we don't lose all those gains we just had and wind up right back where we were when the Supreme Court ruled on the McCleary case originally. Well, it ranges from obviously submitting budget requests that continue to build momentum and not shy away from it, right? So we saw prior uh, superintendents say, hey, these are tough times, let's skinny down our expectations. So we won't be doing that. Obviously, legislative advocacy I'll also be willing to defend in court. And so I've already got my team building what we call the, the McCleary box. We are identifying all the investments that fit in basic ed, the statutory definition, and we're prepared to, to make any legal action necessary if the legislature touches any of that. And due to the work of Summer and others, uh, we actually think about 97% of all of our state appropriation now is, is constitutionally defined in the basic ed box because the legislature told the court that was exactly uh, what they were pointing to to say uh, let us off the hook here so uh, legal action uh, the big megaphone that i get and the budgets that we submit and any partnership we can with community groups and advocacy uh, we will be there for all of it great thank you any other follow-up questions So I have one that my son kind of always asks um, anybody who is running for school board. And so maybe this is the, a proper question for you. Um, he is always curious about school lunches. He's in uh, fourth grade now, and he has occasionally eaten school lunch uh, in his cafeteria here in Seattle schools. And um, his usual question is, is there a plan to improve that at some point? And if so, what is that plan? <laughs> this is an awesome question, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, 40 years later, we're still serving square pizza on Fridays and corn dogs at times. Sometimes it's the favorite for students. But um, so a couple of things have happened that I think are pretty successful. Some really good progressive legislators have helped us bring some kitchens back into a lot of our schools. We definitely have better processes for bringing in fresh produce and opportunities there. Um, the challenge is, of course, this is all locally determined, um, and uh, the vast bulk of our food subsidies, so the financial support we get, 
requires us to buy bulk commodities from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So this is still very much um, in the form of processed foods. It meets fat standards, sodium standards, protein grams. It's got fruits, vegetable balances. I mean, this is, this is okay. It's just not ideal. Uh, it's not what a lot of families would prefer for sure. And so we get to push on that a little bit. And mostly we get to partner with our legislature to, to think about bringing kitchens back, fresh prepared foods in partnerships with local growers so that we can bring more fresh vegetables and fruits in. Uh, but, but for now, definitely the highest volume of food is from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's bulk commodity process because they subsidize our nutrition programs uh, significantly in our state. Great, thank you. I will make sure he sees this. Um, are there any other questions? Summer, go ahead. Hi, Superintendent Rachel, this is Summer Stinson. And I had a question, um, if you could talk about counselors and the importance of counselors, funding for counselors, and specifically um, mental health counselors versus, say, college career counselors, et cetera. And also, you know, one thing I've heard from some legislators is that we could, you know, get some more counselors in the schools on some days by putting some money into um, bringing local counselors from the community into schools. And I, I just have a real strong concern about not having counselors dedicated to understanding um, different age kids and working with the kids and that continuity of practice with the kids and looking for these band-aid solutions, especially with, with using school kids and the concerns there. So I wondered if you could talk about that and those ideas and counselors in general. Yeah, this is really powerful. So this is a perfect example of where a prototypical model might have officially been addressed. The court, you know, let the legislature off the hook here. But if you look at the prototypical models, I know you have, it is so woefully inadequate. Um, it's decent in high school. It is terrible in a middle and it is absolutely longing in elementary school. It's a perfect example of how the court might have thought we were done with basic ed, but we all know it's not the prototypical model that will work. This year was a great example where we got to add significant resources, finally brought in elementary counselors. Um, the governor vetoed that section. And again, cognitively, I understand it. We need trained counselors by grade band uh, who understand child development. So the Band-Aid solutions will not work. We have to change the prototypical model, train our counselors, and they have to reflect from a racial standpoint, the students that they work with too, to create the most meaningful connections. Mental health and whole child supports are going to be everything over the next decade. It is not about more tests, more math, more science, all you know, the content areas are important, but if we're gonna actually close gaps and get more kids over hurdles, it's whole child supports like mental health, nursing, nutrition, racial equity. It's the stuff that wasn't in the old prototypical model and really wasn't necessarily uh, factored into the solution. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for at least ooh, probably two more questions. Um, does anybody have another? Yes, Jason. Uh, yes, Chris, I uh, appreciate your work that you do. Um, you know, as a person uh, from uh, 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 special ed K through 12, one of the first special ed classrooms uh, in Alabama, I'm real concerned that uh, special ed students during this uh, COVID-19 is not getting um, their supports they normally get. Um, could you go over some of your, uh, some of your solutions and maybe uh, ideals that you have for supporting uh, special ed students? Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, so our guidance to districts is that there is no diminution of law, federal or state. There's, no, there's no, nothing in law um, that should make them believe that they should do anything but support our students with disabilities and fully support their IEPs. For many districts, that's gone well. For others, it's been challenging. Um, there are certainly some services that don't lend themselves well to a distance model, uh, but some are okay, and districts need to be focused on those. That's why we've had them include that uh, with special attention in their continuous learning plans. Very there sad. is additional federal aid coming, so we know they can focus on that. We've actually asked our congressional delegation to focus some targeted money 
for what we call compensatory services, so makeup for minutes and services that are not currently being provided to our students with disabilities. Our message to districts is you need to serve these students well, and if you can't, you have to document everything so we can use the summer next year and beyond to really catch up with them. And we're gonna advocate with current dollars, more state money and federal money to get the resources that we need for that. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, one final question. Let me make sure I'm checking here. Any final questions? Ooh, very good. I think that was all of them. Um, so would you be willing to uh, give a one minute wrap up uh, to the folks who might be watching this video later? Great, uh, thank you very much. The reason I'm sitting in my car uh, <laughs> is I've had a lot of 10 to 12 hour days. This will actually be about a 14 half hour day. I'll be done at about 9.30 tonight, but I, I don't do any of this stuff in a state facility. I'm really, it's important to me that we follow our state ethics about that. So I have to get out of our building and, and do a lot of this stuff in, in our car here. Uh, so thank you very much for being a part of this and thank you for the great questions. The 36 is just obviously a force. Uh, your values are so solid. Uh, it really is the heart and soul of the progressive movement. And um, I've been grateful to be a part, like I said, the superintendent doesn't do anything on their own, uh, but I've, I've been blessed to be in a role where I can partner with the right advocates. We've made enormous progress. My colleagues around the country wonder how it is we did it. And I said, uh, well, you needed a group <laughs> and a constitutional provision as strong as ours to, to get to where we are, but we have a lot of work to do. And I just know that, um, at least one person seeking this role wants to undo a lot of that work. And um, I mostly focus on what I need to do and I'm grateful to have a chance and I hope I can earn your support. Thank you so much.